Thank, thank the organizers. So this work is together with my colleague, Professor Zhang Rogers, and my former postdoc, Professor Yi Hui Zhang. And let me motivate you why we do this work. And mo many audience may have heard this word, magic word of 3D printing. So with 3D printing, people can really develop very complex structures in materials, in structures. You can see how small those scales are. Our work is not on 3D printing at all. So don't confuse. Our work is not on 3D printing. And the reason we don't do 3D printing is that 3D printing, even though it's very powerful, it's mainly limited to polymer materials. It can do some metals, but it can never, never, never do semiconductors because for the semiconductors, like in your cell phone, in your laptop, in all the electronic devices, it needs silicon. And silicon has to be grown from its mother wafer in order to process to generate single crystal silicon to make electronics. So what we like to do is to develop a complementary method to 3D printing. It's not 3D printing at all. We want to develop a powerful method that can make three-dimensional structures made of silicon, metals, polymers, and all the materials you can think of. So let me motivate you why we want to do silicon. I already mentioned the silicon is a very powerful material in all electronics. Basically, it has, this method, processing method, has existed for over half a century. All the major companies, Intel, AMD, and all the major companies in electronics, they all use silicon. But for silicon, the, all the processing technique is two-dimensional. They can make everything, whatever complex patterns, for example, the wavy silicon, whatever, but it's all two-dimensional. It's on the planar form. So what we like to do is to take advantage of this powerful processing method for two-dimensional pro problems. Then we make them into 3D. So keep in mind, we want to do 3D, but we use 2D method. So how do we achieve this? Well, many people have already seen those. This is called children's pop-up book to encourage a little child to read, you give him or her a book. When she or he opens this book, a structure pops up. You may have seen this before. Open the book, something pops up. And similarly, those fancy Christmas cards you get for in, around Christmas time, you get a card, it's flat, but when you open the card, a structure can pop up. So basically, this converts a two-dimensional structure into 3D. So we want to use the same idea here, developing everything on 2D. Why 2D? Because the semiconductor fab is very powerful, but it's 2D. Okay. They can make all different materials, all different patterns, how, as small as a few nanometers. But they all do so well, but it's all 2D. So what we like to do, we use their technology on 2D, we pop them up into 3D. And this is our approach. So i like to you to look at this wavy silicon here. This wavy one is the single crystal silicon, but it's 2D. Even though it's wavy, but it's really flat. It's like on this table. What we do is that we use a polymer called silicone. For the silicone, it's marked by this blue color. We can stretch it to make silicone longer and you, we use a brown color to represent the stretched silicone. So it's brown color and blue color, these are the same silicone, one in natural form, one's being stretched. So after it's stretched, then we'll put this wavy, planar, two-dimensional, single silicon on top of the silicone. So this is silicon for electronic on silicone polymer. Then at the select location marked by the red spot, you see those red spots? Then we can bond them together. Silicon, silicone bonded together, but only at the red spot. 
by the way, the bonding is easy. You don't need to use chemicals. You just shed UV light to dioxide and the silicon and silicon at the, at the rest body bonded together, chemical covalent bonding. After the bonding, you let go the pre-stretch of silicon. So this one wants to shrink back to its original length. And obviously, during shrinking, the spacing between those bonding sites, between those red spots, becomes smaller. Once it becomes smaller, the, it compress those single crystal silicon, they buckle. And they cannot penetrate into the silicon, so they can only pop up. Once they pop, pop up, they form this coil shape. Okay. So this is an effective way to convert a two-dimensional wavy silicon into a three-dimensional coil. You can see this two-dimensional wavy silicon, after popping up, becomes three-dimensional coil. So this is the mechanics prediction of the 3D coil shape. This is the experimental image, SEM. Okay, this is SEM image. Let me use a video to illustrate this process. The transparent here is the stretched silicone. This is silicone. The blue spot, blue uh, wavy ones here, this is the single crystal silicon. So silicon on silicone. And those are the spots. Now we let go the pre-stretch. You can see that it starts to shrink. Uh, I didn't, the video didn't play. Let me, let me go back here. Yeah, you can see shrinking now. So the spots here, they are bonded, silicon are bonded to a substrate. They become smaller, and once it becomes smaller, and it squeezes the silicon, the silicon pops up. So it forms the 3D form, okay? Basically, 2D to 3D. And 2D is the semiconductor fab, 3D is what the shape we want. And this one here, the bottom one here, this is, shows the SEM image of three-dimensional wavy silicon. And this is the mechanic prediction of the same pattern. You can see very good agreement in shape. But the mechanics prediction has colors here. We use color to represent the string level in silicon. Why we do that? Because silicon, and like metals and polymer, is a very brittle material, very brittle. With 2% stretching, just 2% breaks. So we have to make sure during this process, the string in silicon is small. You can see those maximum strength here is roughly 0.4%, much smaller than the 2% factor string. So you, you really need the mechanics to design this to make sure that silicon doesn't break during this process when the three-dimensional formation, three-dimensional structure is formed. So let me show you a few more structures. This is the single crystal silicon. You can see that the scale here is 400 micrometers. And this is the mechanical predict shape. You can see very good agreement between the experiment, SEM image, and theory. This is another shape, we call them dual silicon helix. The SEM image, mechanics prediction. This is the nested silicon helix. You can see how complex it is. And, and this one here is mechanical prediction. So you can really make very complex three-dimensional shape by using two-dimensional fabrication technology. So let me show you one more illustration. This is completely two-dimensional initially, but after the silicon shrinks, then it forms a three-dimensional shape. You can see, yeah. This is the SEM image, and this is the final shape. Theory, experiment, they agree very well. Okay. Again, the color represents the string level in those silicons to make sure that it's less than its fracture string such that silicon does not break. So all this pattern here, all this illustration here, basically shows a way we convert a two-dimensional fabrication technology, very mature, very robust, but convert them into 3D using mechanics. So this table summarizes some of the patterns we have formed using this technology, using this approach. In this column here, the second column here with the blue and red color represent the two-dimensional pattern. We call them two-dimensional precursor. So you can see different shapes. The blue represents those ribbons, the single crystal ribbons. For example, you can use the shape of a cross, a square, 
and those wavy patterns, triangles, you can really de design all different two-dimensional patterns. And by the way, fabrication of them is very straightforward with the, the semiconductor fab. It's so standard. You, you want any pattern, and you design the fab, they can output straightforward to you. Equally important are those bonding sites. You can see marked by the red spot. Those are the bonding sites. You can vi visualize this way. When the substrate shrinks, the spacing between the bonding side becomes smaller, so this cross pop up to form the shape of a tent. Okay? So this column, third column marked by the green color, that's the mechanics prediction of the buckled shape. This is 2D, and this one is 3D now. And the last column, the black one here, this is the SEM image. Okay? So you can see very good agreement for the shape of the tent. This is a 2D precursor. This is mechanics predict 3D shape. This is SE SEM image. So you can see that this one, you can really produce a flower shape. This is mechanics prediction. This is SEM image. This is inverted flower. So you, all this, you can see very good agreement between theory and experiment. This shows how powerful mechanics theory can be. But one may wonder why the agreement is so well, and here I want to say there's absolutely no fitting parameter. They're in the mechanics model with no parameter, we can fit the experiments. So why the theory agrees with so well with experiment? Two reasons. Number one, the materials model is simple. This is silicon, it's purely linear elastic. There's no plasticity, no other behavior. Just straight line, linear elastic model. However, the materials deformation is large. So total deformation is still nonlinear for this nonlinear mechanics conference. So that it's really small uh, linear elastic behavior, but nonlinear finite deformation. The second reason for the theory to agree so well with the experiment is that we can do mechanics computation of post buckling very precisely now. So we really don't need parameter fitting, and the theory and experiment can agree so well. So in fact, the theory has to be done, or computation has to be done first, because if you don't do it, silicon breaks. So you have to really do mechanic computation to make sure string in silicon is small, then you can do the fabrication after that. So I want to emphasize that in this pattern design here, the ribbons and those bonding sites marked by the red dots are both important. For example, see the pattern here. This is two triangles, but with six bonding sites in the middle, you generate this two-layer flower theory and experiment. But same two triangles, if you put six bonding sites on the peripheral, then it gets the shape of basket theory and experiment. Three bonding sites in the middle, in the middle get the shape of butterfly, and three bonding sites on the peripheral, you get the shape of starfish. So two things you can play with. Number one, what kind of patterns? You use square, you use triangles, you use, you use a cross, you can try different shapes. Number two, once giving a shape, where do you put the different bonding side marked by the red color? You can generate different shapes. And in addition, I want to show that this approach here, different from 3D printing, it can generate a complex structure in one shot. And like this building, when this beautiful structure is built, I'm sure they have to do the foundation first, then the first floor, second floor, floor by floor. That's also the idea of 3D printing. You have to do one floor one at a time. However, when we want to build a three-layer structure, and we can do one shot, for example, see the picture here? The ground floor pops up, the drives the first floor, the first floor pops up, drives the second floor. So you can form a multi-layer structure in one shot rather than than doing floor by floor. So this is a much quicker way of realizing three-dimensional structures made of silicon. Uh, we published a cover article in Science uh, a few years ago. And let me show you the formation process for this complex structure. Because this one, you can see, is complete 2D. It's flat. And how does, once the substrate shrinks, let's see the formation process. You can very clearly see the three-dimensional structure now. This is a predict, mechanic prediction. This is the final shape predict, uh, given by mechanic, and this is the SEM image. So very clearly shows the image. We take advantage of the semiconductor fab, which is very powerful, works for all materials, but it's two-dimensional. 
but now using mechanic, we can pop them up to get into 3D shape. So we were very happy to publish this article and we tried to make this method working for thin films. If you take a look at the structure we showed before, even though it's very complex, it's mainly ribbons. All these are ribbons. So we want to extend this to thin films and we failed miserably. I'll show you why we failed. So this is the a thin film. Look at this, this is the square film. And the four red are the bonding side. Once the substrate shrink, the spacing between the red bonding side becomes smaller. The squeeze the thin film in the middle and thin film pops up. You can see it here, it pops up into this, pop up into this shape. However, the major problem, you can see this fairly complex shape. However, the major problem is that once it pops up, you clearly see string concentration at those locations. And the string can be as large as 5%, almost 5% string. And silicon fails at 2%. So for 5% string, clearly your electronic device would fail this way. So we wonder why the method works so well for ribbons, but not for thin film. And the reason is actually very simple. When you look at those ribbons, very clearly you can see there's a lot of spacing between the ribbons or among the ribbon. So the, and your ribbons can rotate, can bend to reduce its strength because there's not much constraint on the ribbon. They can do it rotate freely. However, when you deal with thin films, it's all compact together. When it deforms, they cannot rotate freely. They constrain against each other. Therefore, string concentration build and silicon fails this way. So how do we use mechanics to avoid string concentration? It's very simple. Mechanics, you just make some cut, and those cut serves as a location to reduce the string concentration. Right? Just like in the material, you produce some holes, produce some cuts, at this place stress cannot build up, so you can select the cut where the string concentration is the largest, you remove the string. So for this structure to pop up, you can clearly see it forms very complex three-dimensional patterns, but string level is low. It's really like 0.3, 0.4%, much lower than the 2% silicon fracture string. So using this one, you can produce, using this cut, you can produce three-dimensional structure without failure. But do those cut make problem more complex? Not at all. The reason, as I said, for semiconductor fab, as long as it's two-dimensional, it can be anything. So forming this structure here, you don't need to form the thin film first, then use a the scissor to cut. You can form this pattern directly. Just tell the fab, you want this pattern with some cut in the middle, you can form this. Forming formation of this process is as easy as forming of this. It's very straightforward. So with this one, we can really form three-dimensional structures and without much strength concentration. And I'll use this video to illustrate. Look at the picture here. These four on the side are the bonding side. This is the square film with lots of cut. Let's see what kind of three-dimensional structure it forms. You can see the 3D formation process. This pops up and the string level here is quite low, much, it's less than, it's only 0.3%, almost a factor of 10 less than its fracture strength. So this is mechanic prediction of the final shape, and this is the experiment. You can see very good agreement between the two. Once again, there's no parameter frame because the material model is very simple, strict mechanic prediction. And let me show you the, uh, this two-dimensional passion to see what kind of three-dimensional shape it gets to. And this one here, this pops up, you get a jelly, jellyfish, jellyfish, okay? From 2D to 3D, this is mechanic prediction, this is the experiment, and this experiment start from 2D, pops up, up into 3D shape. So this the next table here summarize some of the patterns formed this way, the blue, and red is a two-dimensional precursor. They are flat. Blue represents the film. Red are the bonding side. Now this structure pops up. This is a 3D shape. Green represents the mechanic prediction. So this green column here is all mechanics prediction. And this gray column here is all SEM image. 
again, you can see very good agreement between the theory. So we can really use mechanics as a guiding tool, as a design tool for the 3D, 3D formation process using semiconductors. And this is a combination of both ribbons and the film. You can see the formation process. This is a two-dimensional pattern here. And let's see the formation process. Yeah, it goes from 2D. Those are the bonding sites. It's attached to substrate. And they pop up from 3D. This is theory prediction, and this is experiments. Similarly, for the picture on the right, you can see the same formation process. This goes from 2D to 3D, and this is experiments. Always do the simulation first to make sure the structure does not break, then do the experiments. So those are very nice patterns, but we are not happy. The reason being, those patterns using buckler generated patterns, usually you get smooth curve, like Euler buckling. Think of Euler buckling, a bar buckles into a sinusoidal shape. However, in real structures, they always have some sharp edges, like in this building here, very clearly between the ceiling and the wall, you can see the very sharp edge, okay, very sharp edge. How do we produce those very sharp edge, well, mechanics and health. Think of this way. In this picture here, red are the bonding side where they attach the substrate. They shrink and they provide the driving force for buckling. Blue is the ribbon. They are the one under compression, they will pop up. However, we use the same material of the blue ribbon but we make them thinner. We use this gray color. The gray color here, gray and blue, they are the same material, same material. But for gray, on purposely, we make it thinner. For example, its thickness may be only one third of the blue part. So once the structure pops up, the gray area here with a reduced cross section it takes more strain, so deformation tend to concentrate on those gray parts to form this sharp edge. Okay? So by reducing the thickness, you induce larger deformation at those cross sections. Those serve as hinge. Then they can produce very sharp transition between the straight part. Okay? So when the thickness is uniform, you get new sinusoidal shape. When you have reduced thickness, you produce these sharp edges. This is the part mechanics plays an important role because you want it to be thin such that deformation can concentrate to produce this sharp edge. At the same time, you don't want strain to be too large to fracture. So me mechanics is very important there. And let me use this video to illustrate this formation process. You can see it starts from totally 2D. And this is the hinge that reduced cross section. You can use this to go from 2D to form a 3D formation process, okay? And by the way, this is actually the experiment now done in my, cat, in my own group. So I'm also converting myself from a theoretician also to do experiments now. So this table summarizes some of the two-dimensional pattern, like marked by the blue and red color here. You can see this one. Once this pop up, the form shape of a, of a box, this green column, is the mechanics predict shape, and the gray column here is the SEM image. So once again, very good agreement between theory and experiment without any parameter fitting. You use theory to design it first. Once it's the structure forms, then you, you do the experiment. So let me use these two pictures to illustrate. And this is the, what kind of shape it produces. So in this picture here, you can see some cut, some ribbons here, and some film. And let's see the formation process. It shrinks to go from 2D to 3D. And you can fill up those gaps. So this is the final shape predicted by the theory. And this is actual experiment. Similarly, using this one, you can predict sharp edges. You can see it here. This is a theory prediction. Using finite element analysis, you can see very sharp edge produ produced. And this is the experiment. Okay, so using this approach, 
we can really take advantage of semiconductor effect. And let me give you an idea why we use semiconductor fab because semiconductor fab is very mature very robust typically we talk about the arrow for those semiconductor fab the yield is typically 99.99 percent which means you present 10,000 specimens you probably have one that's defects the rest 9,900 are all perfect okay this is very mature semiconductor fab using advantage taking advantage of that then we can really produce precise structures and without failure. But when we sell this method, when we try to invent this method to electrical engineers for them to produce device, they did not take it well. The reason is that for your cell phone, for your laptop, for all the electronic devices, it really needs to be very compact. You cannot waste any volume or surface area. However, if we use this pop-up technology, it pops up, it's very nice, but the volume underneath the structure is wasted. There's no function, right? You can produce functions, it's all on this pop-up structure, but underneath it's wasted. So this is too much volume, it's very you cannot, this, it's not really practical to them. So how do we solve this problem? Well, what we can do is that we can produce multi-layer structures. For example, you see this layer, blue color, green color, and black color. You can have multi-layers, and each one is two-dimensional, but all on the same substrate. So when the structure pops up, these three layers can form the space. They can fill up the space and to produce multi-layer structure at the same time without wasting, wasting the volume. In fact, we have used this method to produce a very small scale of the Sydney Opera House. I know someone from Australia have seen this, but those who have not, you can see this is a picture, Sydney Opera House, but we can produce very small scale. How small? On the auto, on the off of smaller than one millimeter. But using two dimensional technology, and then pop them up into the 3D shape. So let me use this picture, the video to illustrate this process. These two on the top, are the mechanics prediction. The two at the bottom are the experiments. You can see the formation process. You can see they use all the space underneath because multi-layer structures are popped up simultaneously. In those structures here, you can see four layers, blue, green, purple, and brown. And each one is two-dimensional, all layered up, they pop up, they can fill up the entire space here. And I'll skip this one in, in the interest of time, but this is um, the next one is also very interesting. We all learned in mechanics the theory of Euler buckling. When a structure buckles, it can form a very nice arc shape. For example, when you have a straight bar, when it's under compression, then you can form an arc shape when the straight bar buckles. But the mechanic prediction tells you there are more buckling shape, not just a half arc, uh, an arc. And you can have three arcs, but for mechanic, you can have the up, down, then up again. You can have five arcs, even though in reality, they, they are never realized. It always goes to a half arc shape. But in the mechanic theory, you can go to three arcs, five arcs, can have multiple shapes for, for buckling. Why? Because the one half arc, one arc shape, that gives a lower energy. So those higher energy mode is very difficult to realize. However, using this approach driven by the substrate contraction, we can realize very different shapes using the same geometry. In other words, with the same two-dimensional design, we can reach different patterns. Let me illustrate this for you. Look at the picture here. This is a two-dimensional, this is a substrate, the, okay, the transparent substrate. They are being stretched 100% in both x, x 100%, y 100%, equal back to stretching 100%. And on top, we put these two-dimensional ribbons. See the blue color here? Those are the two-dimensional ribbons. And red are the bounding side. Okay. And in addition, you see the green color. What is the green color? 
that is the location we put the same material but reduced thickness where we want the hinge to form. So now you can see this structure here. Once the string is pre-string is relaxed, the bounding side like to shrink, the spacing between the rest part becomes smaller, and structure like to pop up. But we have two different ways of relaxing the string, relaxing the pre-string. We can relax the pre-string from 100% in both xy direction to 50%. And so in other words, 100% stretch, then we let go, that will shrink to 50% in both directions. During that stretching, very clearly, this ribbon will be shortened, and this ribbon will also be compressed. Therefore, they pop up. In this structure here, the center very clearly, they pop up here. It's here the center, they pop up, because at both and x, y, buckle, they pop up here. If you shrink this further, reduce further, from 50% in both directions zero, this is the final structure form. And by the way, this is the experiment. Okay, this is the experimental pattern using formation this way. However, you can release a pre-string not simultaneous. For example, we can keep the Y string to be 100%. This is 100% for Y, 100% for Y. So in other words, in the Y direction, we do not relax the pre-stretch at all. It's still 100%. But we relax the X direction stretch from 100% down to zero. So you can clearly see in X direction here, it shrinks. But in y direction, it cannot, we, we still stretch it. Therefore, because the y direction is stretched, the center part cannot pop up. Because in y direction is stretched, you still, have to, you still have the constraint. Therefore, the center remains on the substrate. It cannot pop up. Now, if you relax the y direction stretch, the center is still at the bottom, at the substrate. So once it's completely relaxed, you form this structure. So with the same two-dimensional precursor and two-dimensional design, you can generate different, you can realize different patterns. This is one real 3D structure, this is another 3D structure. So it's really that same two-dimensional design, you can go to different 3D structures. Just like we realize oil buckling, we can realize the one arc, we can realize three arc, we can realize five arcs by putting bound inside. So let me illustrate you one interesting design. This design here is our two-dimensional precursor. Okay, red are the bound inside, blue are the film and ribbons here. And this is the mechanics prediction and this is the experiment. It's pre-stretched 100% in both x, y direction. And let me relax to see what kind of shape it generates. So you can see the pre-string is relaxed in X and Y relaxed simultaneously. And this pops up, and this is the shape of an octopus. Okay, you pop up, you pop up into an octopus shape. Now let's go back. We release Y pre-string first. So you can see the Y string is released, but this X direction is still being stretched. After this is stretched, then we release the X, so X direction shrinks. So the final shape is a spider. So use the same two-dimensional design, you can either get an octopus shape, you can get a spider shape, depending how you control your release sequence. Okay. And there are more different patterns, uh, there are more patterns here. This is a two-dimensional design. If you release them simultaneously, you get this shape. And se sequentially, you get a different shape. For example, Look at this two-dimensional pattern, and if you release simultaneously, you get the shape of a house, theory and the experiment. But if you release them sequentially, you get the shape of a bag, a, ba a basket a bag, okay? And there are also some other different shapes. But keep in mind, they are all start from the same two-dimensional design. Just by releasing differently, you can realize different shape. In fact, the shape is not just two. It can be much more. For example, the theory and the experiment, really simultaneously, you get one shape, we call them mode one, this is the shape one. That's release them simultaneously. But now if you release them sequentially, you can choose to release in the Y direction first. You can see Y is relaxed, X is still being held. Now X is relaxed here. Again, theory and the experiment. You can see it here. 
that you reach this shape. We call them mode two. And you can choose to reverse. This time, you release x first, then y followed by the y release. So the x release, now the y release. You can see this experiment in theory. You reach shape of mode number three, the third mode. In fact, you can do more complex. You can go to x release partially, only 30% to release. Y, then 20% release, you release the rest uh, uh, simultaneously. So you can then reach shape in number four. Okay? So it's really very complex energy landscape. You can re realize different, uh, different buckling patterns by controlling the releasing sequence. And one more thing, one more challenge from electrical engineering is that this is, can generate 3D patterns. But those 3D patterns can only be formed after the substrate is relaxed to provide the driving force. If you remove the substrate, that will spring back, back to 2D. Because you, you need the substrate, this driving force, to pop them up. So in a lot of electronic applications, they don't want any substrate. You just want the isolated device that you can put in your cell phone. So how to fabricate that? So I will skip the details, but just to illustrate, we use this shape memory polymer together with electronics, together with silicon. Basically, you have the, uh, all this silicon, or all this electronic materials, but it's sandwiched by shape memory polymer. So in the middle is your electronic, on top and bottom you have shape memory polymer or shape memory alloy. Why we need shape memory alloy or polymer? Because it can memory that thing. So we use a pop-up structure to, to reach this 3D shape. Then we activate the shape memory maximum so it can memorize this structure. Then you remove the bonding side here. You chemically dissolve the bonding side. The substrate, the blue part, is gone. But the shape memory polymer, remember this, to keep in shape, so you can have freestanding, freestanding shape form this way. And this shows you, it's actually very powerful. You can see, you can use a tweezer. This is 3D shape form. You can use a tweezer to push it, to push it back to 2D. But if you remove the tweezer, it bounces back. Okay, it bounces back to 3D. So this shape memory pop keeps it in, into shape. So this one method I already demonstrated, it works very well for uh, silicon, but I want to illustrate it works for well for all materials. As long as you can do 2D, you can do 3D pop-up. For example, uh, here you can see it works for different materials. It works for SU8, for PI, for nickel, this is really metal. For nickel, for gold, this is also metal. And for all different materials, for example, nano, nano disc. And, and let me illustrate here, use my, oh, we see the shape of a tiger. This is two, it, it was 2D. It was a 2D shape and pop up into a 3D tiger. So this is just for, to demonstrate this method worked for 3D, uh, for different materials. This is for nickel. Again, theory and experiment overlap on top. And this is for SU8. The blue is the theory prediction. The green is the experiment. You can see, again, they overlap very well uh, for the, for, for the, between the theory and experiment. No parameter fitting. And again, here, this is for gold, and this is for SU8, and this is uh, for different materials. You can see it can integrate different materials. It doesn't have to be one material. You can have, on two-dimensional layout, you can have gold somewhere, silicon somewhere, SU8, and different, but then you can still pop them up to, to, to form 3D structures. So what about lens scale? How small or how large can we push this approach? This one demonstrate it can go as small as 100 nanometer in thickness. So in this picture here, I want to illustrate the green is the mechanical predict shape. The gray is the S image. You can see very good agreement between them. You can form the shape of a pyramid, raised ring, basket. Theory experiment still agree very well. So this is 100 nanometer thickness. Can we go smaller? Yes, we can go to 50 nanometer, no problem. Go to 30 nanometer, no problem. But when you push below 30, we run into difficulty. The difficulty is that 
Well, for very thin structures, there is a vendable force between the substrate and the structure. Vendable force, that's always there. For thick ones, it doesn't matter. It's weak, relatively weak. But for very thin structures, it's like some kind of adhesion. So it's, it's those adhesion, the, due to vendable force, prevent your 2D structure from popping up. It do, do not pop up uniformly. So that was a challenge. So how do we overcome that challenge to pop up structure that is smaller than 30 nanometers? It's doable, but it's more costly. The way to do it is, is you have a structure, let's say, very thin, one nanometer. What you do is that you sandwich this one nanometer structure. On top and bottom, you put other materials but thicker. So all together, it can be 30 nanometer, 40 nanometer. 30 and 40 nanometer is not a problem. You can pop them up. But after you pop them up, you chemically dissolve the top and bottom sandwich layer to leave the middle layer, to, to save the middle layer. Okay? So we call the top and bottom, we call them sacrificial layer, sacrificial layer. Okay? They are to be dissolved. So this way, we successfully pop a single layer of atom, a single layer of graphene. It's a single layer of atom. We put on top and bottom some materials, then pop them up, then dissolve and bottom, you have a single layer left. So going down is challenging, but it's doable. However, going to thicker is not a problem. 300 nanometer now, you can see green is our theory. Gray is experiment, you can see very good agreement. Going even thicker now, the two micron, micrometer thickness, Blue, uh, uh, this green is our theory, and the gray is experiment. SEM image, you can see very good agreement. And this is actually done in my lab now. You can see this, this is scale really on the order of centimeter scale, okay? This is for 100 micrometer thickness, and this is all start from 2D, pops them up into 3D structure. Another challenge that shows up is you can design two-dimensional pattern, pop them into 3D. But the real problem is you have a 3D shape in mind. You, like this house, this beautiful building. You have a 3D shape in mind. How do you design the two-dimensional pattern to finally pop up into the desired target shape? So this is what we call them inverse design. You have a 3D shape in mind, how to do 2Ds here. And let me illustrate uh, our approach here. This is a video, it starts from flat of a mantis. Okay, initially it's flat, it pop up into 3D. This is a scorpion, okay. You probably don't see on this island, but it really starts from flat and pops up into 3D. And what is the general approach for our inverse design? When you have a 3D shape, how do we design the 2D? And let me show you the approach here. This is the hemisphere. What do we do is, this is a hemispherical shape, okay? It's a 3D structure. What we do is we cut them into slices. To draw an analogy, it's like you buy a watermelon. You get a watermelon, it's 3D shape, but you can cut it into pieces. Cut it into eight pieces or 16 pieces, and each piece is a ribbon, but it's a 3D ribbon. So for 3D ribbon, we have analytical theory. We can predict analytical. If you have a 3D ribbon, how to design the two-dimensional 2D ribbon and to pop up into 3D. So in this two-dimensional design, what we change? The, thick, the, the width cannot be changed because it has to fit the 3D. It cannot have any gap, but you can change the thickness. So by changing, it's not uniform. So by changing the thickness, you can design the two-dimensional pattern to go to pop up into 3D. And let me, this is 2D. Now it can pop up into a 3D hemispherical shape. And similar, this is the drum shape. It was 2D, but using this design, by changing the thickness, you can pop up into 3D shape. And similarly, we have other patterns. The, the, the two pictures I showed, those are actually simple because they are all convex structure. It's a watermelon or it's a drum, it's watermelon. The more challenged shape would be those complex shapes involving both concave and convex structure. For example, look at the flower here. The flower, some part is convex, some part is concave, right? So for this concave, like, look at the flower here. The flower here, this part, and 
is convex and the other part is concave, but we can still do the same design to cut them into different slides and pop them up to form 3D structures. This is our two-dimensional precursor, and this is the final shape. This is a concave lens, okay, also using this design. And this is uh, the structure we want to avoid. This is a, a rat, but you can cut the rat into different pieces and still pop them up to get the 3D shape. So I like just to go over a few applications. We really want to develop this method as a way for other people to use. But to demonstrate, we also seek a few applications ourselves to demonstrate. So one application is in medicine. And we all know that we want electronics to monitor uh, people. For example, to measure your heart, EKG, you have to go to the hospital to, to measure your brain activity. And this is uh, EEG, you also have to go to the hospital to, to do it. Can all this be done at home, away from the hospital? Well, it can be done, but you need really flexible electronics. So those electronics made of silicon, again, made of silicon, need to be so flexible they can be integrated with the human body. Put, for example, on your chest. Then you can really measure all your heart activity without going to. But you're you know, putting on your chest here, you, you really move, and so you need the electronic to be stretchable. So using this approach, we can develop three-dimensional stretchable electronics and using this one, I'll skip why we do the mechanics analysis. Basically, for the 3D electronics here, you really need to make sure the silicon doesn't break, and this is our design. And I'll show you, I'll skip the details. This is our mechanics design. This is really the final animal calculation. In all this design here, all these squares and rectangles, those are the functional electronic component, inductors, capacitors, all this, those are the square, uh, yeah, they are definitely electronic functions. And those wires, those are two-dimensional, those are wavy serpentine two-dimensional inter, uh, interconnects. So we pop them up to form the 3D shape. And this is popped up to get in the 3D shape, and this is the final electronic made this way. And now we can integrate with human body so I just want to show you here, this one can be put on the skin. It's like a patch, put on the skin here. And what that does it do? It can measure your ECD, okay? You frequently, when you have heart problem, you go to the hospital to measure. This can measure your ECG activity. So it's now start measuring. And it can wireless transmit a signal, or your ECG signal. Transmit it into your cell phone. And look at this, and this, this is the ECG. You see the, the pattern is coming up. It takes time. Yeah, this is your ECG signal. This is the ECG signal, and now you can send this ECG using your cell phone, send to your doctor, send to the hospital, so they can immediately diagnose what the problem might be. Okay. This is not just for ECG for your heart pain, also do, uh, this is an ECG signal, can also do EMG. This is a muscle activity for you. When you squeeze your hand, your muscle activity, that you can record this. This is e EOG to read, measure the activity related to your eye. This is EMG related to your brain activity, okay? That's application number one, biomedical application. Number, application number two is really bio-inspired, and you see all these uh, flower seeds. Those smaller flower seeds they can really fly in the sky for, thousands, for hundreds of miles. I mean, if with, uh, they drop very slowly, so very easily, they can fly 10 miles, 20 miles, you know, even 100 miles, it's not a problem, okay? So you can see, yeah, we call them, this is called like a parachute type. This is a helicopter type, and this is a glider type. They can really stay in the air for a long time. So we like to design sensors using those kind of shape, bow inspired. We like to design sensors. So you can put them in the air, they can stay in the air for a long time while wireless transmitting signals. So this is our three-dimensional design. You can see it here. If it's simply 2D, it drops very fast. This is 2D, 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 drops. If it's 3D, it drops a lot slower. 
a three-dimensional. It's really like the helicopter type. So this one actually compared the terminal speed for different materials. This is rice. The brown rice, the one you can eat, brown rice, jasmine rice, and different, the flower seed. This is a terminal speed, and it drops pretty fast. But with our design of 3D structure, the terminal speed is really only reduced by a factor of 10. So it drops very slow and can stay in the air for, for a long time. Okay, you can see it here. This is our micro flyer can really stay in the air for a time. But for this, our micro flyer design is really start from 2D pop up into 3D. We can really make them functional. Okay, for example, lots of components. You have NSC coil it's for wireless communication. You can, you can monitor that and send signal wirelessly. It has a UV sensor. Why we need UV sensor? It doesn't have power. It uses a UV sensor to absorb the sunlight using the, the, the harvest of the uh, solar energy to power it. So it doesn't need battery. It just harvests the energy from, from, from the sun. And it has a microcontroller. It can do all the sensing. For example, this one can really monitor the pH value in the sky. You throw this in the water, it can go into a disaster region, lots of pollution, and it can monitor the pH value and other, sense, uh, other uh, 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 electrophysiological signals. And for the last one, uh, I will skip this uh, presentation by show you a video. And this video is our recently, most recently published work. And fortunately, it uh, doesn't show up. Uh, let me see if I can get this to work. Sorry, this one works on my computer, but somehow it doesn't show. But anyway, so I have to go back to, I have to go back to this. Uh, Yeah, I have to go back to this slide. Just to illustrate, using this approach here, we can really make uh, the one of the smallest robots. Okay, this is robotic robots. And how small it is, the scale is on the order of 200 micrometer. So the entire thickness, not thickness, the entire dimension, the largest dimension of the robots is like your hair thickness. Okay, pull a hair, your thickness. That's the dimension we make. We make robots this way, and using this pop-up technology, you can see it here. It goes from 2D, pop-up into 3, and each one is a robot of the shape of a crab. You can see how it moves. This is robot moves. So this one is actually much smaller than a flea. And what is the, what is the motivation? This one you can really inject into the body to do all the hard work, for example, delivery truck and do the, all the things. And this robot here does not have battery, does not have power. How, what kind, why it works? You shed laser. Shed laser and laser, they provide the driving force for this to work. And let me show you the, uh, let me show you how the, uh, it works. So by uh, the picture on the right here, there, was, oh, there are three robots they can move at different speeds. What controls their speed? By the frequency of the laser scanning. If you put laser frequently or, or, or slowly, you can see it here. Sorry. It didn't really play. Yeah, you can see this is a fast moving robot. This is slowing. This is all by itself. And the, the, the dimension here is very small. The, your thickness, the thickness of your hair. This is the one very slow. Okay? Just depends how, how quickly you scan your laser. And not only can it go straight, but look at the picture in the middle here, it can rotate. Sorry. Somehow, sorry. Yeah, it can move now. You can see this, this one can rotate. Okay, so you can use laser to provide guiding force for this uh, little robot to rotate. And it can do many functions. For example, can do bending, can do twisting, can do crawling, can do walking, can do different things. So with this one, uh, I like to stop 
and entertain any questions you may have, but I'd like to add one thing. We are not developing new mechanics. We are using the mechanic theory to really powerful technology, to together with electrical engineers, material scientists. However, in mechanics here, the post-buckling analysis here, I want to admit, the post-buckling is still a, quite a challenge. Because initial buckling, let's say the string is 0.1, let's, it's, a, it's a small string. Post-buckling, I want to know, let you know how much post-buckling. The post-buckling string can be 100 or even 500 times bigger than the initial. It's a way, way beyond the initial buckling. It's in the very large post-buckling. But using mechanics for that domain, we can really provide the driving force for some technology development. Thank you. like applications with this idea. And the second question is, what is the software you use to simulate the 2D to 3D buckling? Oh, OK, very good question. Let me answer the second question first. Simulation, just Abacus. Just using Abacus is standard. It's actually quite robust to use. We don't even need to do any program. Just tell, material model is very simple, linear elastic. right? Put into Abacus, all the shape can generate. So this is simple. Regarding the application, the, the, the uh, robotics we produced already can do two functions. One is it can sense the UV exposure. Basically, for people who are afraid of the skin cancer, those sensors, those robots can really attach, to detach the, um, the sun exposure level. But there's more important. I know for gentlemen, they usually are afraid of sun because of the skin cancer. For, for, for ladies, they have, because the sun exposure can damage their skin, so they don't look as young. So for, the, for them, their care is really the looking. And for that one, this one, for those sensors, the company most interested in our product is actually not medical companies, medicines. It's L'Oreal, because that's a cosmetic, and, and it's really for them. The second, so the other uh, sensors, it can, the other thing it can sense is the pH value. You put it there, it can really sense the local pH value. No, we can put more sensors on, onto this, but we are working with the electrical engineers on that right now. Basically, if you think of a sensor, and we can use the technology to make them work into 3D and put in the robots. Thank you. So, I have one question. Uh, you know I like dynamics. Yes. So, um, in this case, you pop up a three-dimensional structure uh, shrinking the uh, substrate of uh, silicon. Uh, what about the influence of releasing the stress? So if you move very slowly, that's quasi-static, but mm -hmm. maybe in production you like to do in nanosecond. You know, you just release it and will be the same results or you might expect something different? Yeah, uh, we have not done extensively the dynamic study for this one yet. But so far, I just want to give you an idea. Those structures, uh, if you release them within a few seconds, then the dynamics effect is not, sub not significant. But if you want to do very fast, then uh, it's very, possible the initial effect come to play. We have not, but we have not done study on, on those yet. But this is an excellent question. Uh, I have another question. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, Thank my you. question is regarding the degree of freedom that you get with this uh, 3D geometry. You mentioned these two um, uh, controls that we had, the, the binding signs and the geometry of the 2D structure. Yeah, basically patterns and bounding side. Might there be another one, basically by just controlling the deformation of the silicone that you have underneath? So if you 
I mean, I think now you have like equivalential extension usually, right? Oh, no, no, no. The, the, the exam several examples I showed are equal by axial. But you are absolutely right. You can, uh, you, you are saying beside the equal value, there could be other pattern to control. Very good point. I didn't emphasize that. You can do uniaxial stretching. Mm -hmm. You could biaxial, but not equal. That's another way, right? But you can also actually do bending and twisting. The substrate can bend them. You can, you can bend them, you can, you can do twisting. So that's, th there are more factors uh, that can control. In addition, I want to emphasize, there are a lot of other things. For example, right now, with this pattern, you relax the strain, either uh, do equal biaxial or, 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 or biaxial or uniaxial, those are still uniform strain, right? What if we want non-uniform strain? For example, the same 2D pattern, I want some to pop up more, some to pop up less. In this one, we can play with the substrate. But the substrate, we can make the thickness non-uniform, right? Some part thinner, some part thicker. Thicker part has smaller strain. Thinner part has a larger strain. So they have, they have naturally, they lead to different parts. So there are more ways to control besides the bonding side, besides the pattern, like you suggested, different loading pattern. But also, we don't have to use a force. Why we have the relaxation? Provide the driving force, right? But if you have material, you can use light to change. You can use electricity to change. Right? You can use pH value to change. As long as it shrink, it can pop up. You can have different driving. It doesn't have to be mechanical. We use mechanical to demonstrate, but we have also realized using electricity to, to control this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But that's a very good question. Can I ask this question? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, talk. Uh, thank you. I have two questions. One is about the freestanding uh, structure. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the silicon layer at the bottom, and on top there is the memory shape uh, material. But between, I saw two other materials. I'm uh, curious about the reason of the other two materials. And the other question is about the material of the... Well, let, me, let me answer your first question first, before I forget. <laughs> if you have two questions, I may not remember. So the first question about free, let's think this way, that you have the substrate on top without the shape memory, it's just one, one material, like sil silicon, right? So you can pop them up. But if you remove the substrate, the sh silicon has no driving force, it will shrink back. So what we do is that for the silicon, before you put it on substrate, we send with the silicon with both on top and bottom, shape memory polymer or shape memory alloy. So now you put a composite, first layer, shape memory polymer, second layer, silicon, third layer, shape memory polymer. All three layers are fabricated, but they are all, all 2D, all in 2D. So they can be easily done by the fab. If it's 2D, you can different materials, layers, it's not a problem. Once we transfer them onto this, we bond them. After bonding them, they pop up into 3D. Then, we dissolve, then after into 3D, at this time, we change the temperature. Why temperature? Because temperature can activate the shape memory mechanism. So after the temperature is changed, cool it down, the shape memory re remember that shape. You remove the substrate, there's no more driving force, but it's like the shape memory confines it, does not let, let your silicon relax. It cannot go back because the shape memory confines it. Does that explain the structure? So we need more than one layer of shape. Correct. Yeah, more than one layer, even several layers, yeah. is not a problem as long as each layer is flat. That's the key. For semiconductor fab, they can do 50 layers, multiple. The key is each layer must be flat. Yeah. That, that's not a problem. And how about the, the robot, the sub-millimeter robot? Their material is silicon or something else? Oh no! Right now, for this materials here, we have both silicon and also shape memory polymer in it. But this is really a demonstration. For if it works for silicon, it can also work for other materials. Just depend on what kind of function we want the robot to do. But the, the key is, it works for silicon, it pretty much works for all the materials, because silicon is the most brittle materials. Thank you. Thank you.